flights in and out of the Gerald R. Ford International Airport. And we really pride ourselves on being that, that gateway, that connection to the global economy. Again, whether it's people or packages that are coming and going, pride ourselves on being that important gateway uh, for West Michigan. And this catchment area has grown. And you'll see here in the next slide, the, the work that we've been doing to, to help promote that, help push that along. So one of the big things that we like to tout is the service that we get from Allegiant. It's one of our air carriers here. Uh, they have been very bullish on our market. Uh, even before the pandemic, they started out with a, a maintenance base here. You can see the information, you know, $43 million airline investment, 66 uh, permanent jobs, and doing better than Michigan's average wages. But the important piece with Allegiant is also the opportunity that they bring. And Casey, if you would advance the slide for me. Bringing in low fares, stimulating the market, adding new service into the area has been a huge benefit, not just because of the jobs that, that, you know, that the company has brought in here, but by their focus on providing service in and out of our region uh, it's providing the community, the citizens of our community, the able, you know, the ability to get to and from places that they want to go. And this time of year in Michigan, people want to go to sun and fun destinations, uh, but that's not the only places that they serve. So you can see in the, the right there, new service to Boston. Uh, they provided service to LA last year. They launched that. We're also looking forward to them serving the Newark uh, market as well as Destin. And so the, um, the number of flights that they have been providing into our market, despite the pandemic, has caused them to grow faster than, than any of the others in our market. And our passengers, the flying community, um, have picked up and, and taken to these flights and, and have really uh, benefited from them. I mentioned airfare and that's very important because one of the other dynamics that we were trying to focus on was bringing in low fare service to help stimulate and drive more competition amongst our airlines to the benefit of the passengers. So you, me and others, we're gonna be paying a little bit less on, on a ticket price. So you can see the green bar there, we're below the national average. This is giving you a little bit of an indication on some of our peer markets. You may not know all the uh, three letter identifiers down there, but looking at, you know, off to the left, Muskegon, then you come over into some of these yellow bars, Kalamazoo, Traverse City, um, over into Milwaukee, uh, Louisville. So places that are comparable to us, either close proximity or same type of size airport operation is what we're comparing to. And again, for the, for the most part of the biggest takeaway here is airfare has and continues to be below the national average out of Grand Rapids, which is key. This slide gives you an indication of the market share. Really what I would share with you on here is not so much the change from year to year because 2020 is gonna turn out to be just sort of a, um, a blip and, and maybe a, a hiccup in terms of the way things look. Uh, when we get back to some sort of normal and the airlines refigure out how they're gonna do business going forward, these, these pie charts will probably look pretty similar again, but just giving you an indication that when you look at the market share by airline, it's best to have a nice, most equally distributed pie chart. And we're pretty close to that. If you look at you know Delta, American, Allegiant, then Southwest, and United, and then Frontier, a, a little bit smaller sliver, pretty good market share balance between all those, which means none of them have a dominant hold on what the airport is able to do in terms of development, nor in terms of driving pricing for our passengers. So to have a nice equal balance like this is an illustration of having a healthy market for air service. And typically that means competitive airfares, which means the consumer pays a little bit less or at least is uh, very competitive with the airfare that we're, we're purchasing. Of course, we'd also like to take the opportunity just to, to tout, you know, we, we talk about the benefit to the community. A lot of the stuff that we do here is, is not for us ourselves, the airport, it is for others and, and it's places for others to do business and for the community uh, to thrive. In this case, very proud to be 
on the leading role for delivering uh, personal protective equipment for our frontline workers. As you can see in, in this slide, it was a, a chartered 757 that came in, no passengers, full of boxes, uh, masks and equipment for our frontline workers. On this next slide, many of you will know the coverage that we got with the Pfizer vaccine coming out of just north of Kalamazoo, being trucked up here, put on FedEx airplanes, and literally were the first airport in the US to ship the Pfizer vaccine out by airplane and get that out literally uh, around the world and into the arms of the folks that need it. So very proud to be able to play that role. Most of the time people think of the airport as again, just, you know, somewhere to go when you want to go have a, a fun trip and, and go to a wedding or see friends and family or take that vacation. But behind the scenes, there's also a lot of critical work and critical workers that uh, rely on it. And we certainly want to make sure that people are aware of that. So one of the things that we want to do is make sure that people are safe, right? So we have launched the Fly Safe, Fly Forward campaign, which is really positioning information out for the consumer for what to expect if you haven't flown in the past, say, nine months, because things have, have changed. So Casey, if you want to flip forward to the slide here, you can see on these next couple slides, just social distancing, visual cues, making sure people know what they need to do, wearing facial coverings, um, having plastic barriers between the customer touch point and an employee that may, may need to interact with them, whether that's Transportation Security Administration, a ticket counter at the airlines or at the rental car, but just providing a safer means for people to travel and to get through the processing through the airport uh, without having to do as much touching as what we were doing prior to COVID. So we focused a lot on our cleaning and sanitization protocols, really testing robotics, uh, infrared um, sanitization techniques. And you can, I think on this next slide, you'll be able to see um, just trying to make sure that we're picking up on best practices for some things that we think will stick well beyond the pandemic. So things that have been learned and implemented as a result of the pandemic that we just think are good initiatives to keep going forward. Um, in, this, in this case here, we're, we're looking at the GBAC STAR accreditation uh, process. So we anticipate that we'll be uh, GBAC STAR certified very soon, which again is just basically saying, not that we think we're doing all the right things, but somebody else going through the rigor of understanding what it is that we do and that we follow proper procedures and protocol demonstrating compliance with over 20 elements in this program to certify that we are in fact doing what, what's needed and, and what's appropriate. Um, next slide. Do you wanna advance one more, Casey? One of the things that we did as, a, as we got into the pandemic is trying to really understand what are West Michigan businesses thinking about? What are they, what are you all planning to do with travel? and getting back into offices and having people get back on airplanes um, to do business. And so we did this survey initially back in the uh, June timeframe. We just did it again in December. This is the most recent results. They're very similar in terms of kind of that left-hand side of the graph where over 50% and roughly 55% the first time around saying, we expect that we're gonna be traveling again in you know, the next six months. So that hasn't changed much. The, the sentiment is still very strong. West Michigan businesses want to get back to business and, and putting people in planes and, and doing the work that they need to do. On the next slide here, you can see the difference will be it won't be as many people or the same people won't be flying as often. So if you look at the left side of this graph, you can see about 65% are saying that we will be traveling, but it'll be at a much less volume. So 50 to 60% of a volume of what we were in 2019. So we're optimistic that the survey results are pretty accurate once the, you know, basically stay at home orders and travel restrictions and everything get lifted, that we'll start to see people come back. But again, our anticipation and what we hear and talk to the airlines about is this being a much longer road 
for recovery, especially for business. We're seeing a lot of interest and a lot of traffic on the leisure side, which is pretty much all that we're seeing in terms of the recovery right now. Next slide, if you would, Casey. So I mentioned earlier that we're proud that West Michigan is, you know, we're, we're resilient, we're strong, we're ready to work, we're ready to get back to work. This graph, while it's a little bit busy, if you look off to the left, that's where we basically entered the pandemic. You can see the blue line is the Gerald R. Ford International Airport throughput, where the red line is the national average throughput. You can see on the far left, we were doing better than the national average before the pandemic hit. Obviously it hit in the middle of March. We fell fast and fell hard, dropping lower than most at, at that time back in the, the first and second week of April. But if you look at that and note going back out of that, we started recovering a little bit stronger, a little bit faster, and we continue to pace about 10 percentage points above the national average in terms of throughput, meaning the people that are going through the airport to get on airplanes. So we're proud of that. That speaks well for our business. That speaks well, and more importantly, to the airlines that we have people that are willing and able and ready to fly. That tells the airline that the Grand Rapids market is worth investing in and providing additional routes. And that's why we're seeing routes reinstated faster and new routes actually being added despite the pandemic because of what those airlines are seeing in terms of our passengers and, and the community responding and, and recovering much better. Corey, before we leave the airline front for a minute, I had a really good question come in talking about Allegiant and the ultra low cost and low cost carriers. The question is how does some of the, the budget airlines or those low cost carriers choose airports? Is it based on geographies, routes? Curious what, what dictates their decisions? So there are a lot of decisions that will go into it. And I will tell you mostly it's going to be what is the market. So when I just mentioned the throughput numbers, every airline is looking at the market and, and trying to decide, is that market a healthy market? Can we make money by connecting that market to somewhere else, whether it's a business to business connection? So, you know, getting back out to the New York area um, for business or a sun and fun destination, as in the case with Allegiant, getting flights to take people to places that they want to go. Can they make a go of that? And some of that will actually boil down into negotiations with the airports as well in terms of how well is the airport run? How efficient is it? How can they save money and actually earn more revenue out of your airport versus another? So we're always focused on the cost side, the expense side, because that does mean something to the airlines when they are factoring in a long formula of variables about whether they should serve a market or not. I know that's kind of a long-winded answer, but it's a lot of information that's taken in and um, expenses and, and costs, efficiency, but primarily, what is the market able to provide the airline? That's what they're interested in. And it's what, what, I, what really surprised me in the industry is how much courting happens between airports and airlines trying to find what does our market need, right? What does West Michigan need to connection to? What business drives demand what other cities? And then us explaining that to airlines and airlines fitting us into their business model. It's a, a ever-evolving conversation. Um, thanks, Tori. That was a great question. And a personal reason for that was Rebecca here who asked, um, I have a good family friend who works for Allegiant Airlines and um, they have kind of the buddy pass and I believe they were housed at Flint previously and um, transitioned over to Grand Rapids maybe within the last year or two, I'm sure you can correct me. And so just curious what was driving that shift for that airline to change from one to the other city. And, and you certainly answered that. So I appreciate it. Good to know the inner workings. Great. So let's dive a little bit into infrastructure, if we could. Um, and I, I was telling Graham, my dirty secret is I, I had a CDT. I don't know if those expire. I actually started my career in West Michigan with Stan and, and Earhart Construction. Um, so let's dive into a four hour dissertation on infrastructure at the airport, right? That's why we're all here. No, just, just kidding. I'd be remiss though if we didn't acknowledge kind of West Michigan's role as a whole. We actually started very early 
uh, very early flight was first here at the fairgrounds. And there's some fascinating uh, reasons why we were early adopters of aviation. Beginning over 100 years ago now, we broke ground on the first airport in West Michigan. And certainly it was a different location and looked very different than it does today. Uh, you see a number of runways there, much shorter, a few thousand feet each, oftentimes grass, right? A very different, different scenario. Uh, so here's the airport in 1930. And if you would pull up your chat box, I know we're not in person and it's not a, a stumble through the airport inner innards like would be a lot of fun. And I think Rebecca, you alluded to earlier, um, but something happened in the, the 1950s and they, they paved a 5,000 foot runway. So hop in your chat box there and curious why you think they paved a 5,000 foot runway in the, in the mid fifties. So it's the runway you see kind of off to the right in the picture there and turned into what is today Roger B. Chaffee Boulevard. Um, so what in the world was happening mid fifties, the president's plane to land, good one, Charlie shuttle landing, emergency landings. This is good. I haven't seen it yet. Good guesses. It was actually industry of West Michigan. That was, was driving, not military. It was industry. Um, and it was the onset of the jet engine, the jet engine. So we were seeing, you know, more and more change from, from the, the early aircraft, like you see here, and, and Miss Grand Rapids to jet engines. So what a lot of people don't know is we were actually half of the first ever commercial, scheduled commercial air service between Grand Rapids and Detroit. It was actually Ford Field in Detroit, not the football stadium, uh, but an airport that doesn't exist any longer. And we were at, at the foreground, and my goodness, how different air travel looks today. So in 1963, airport moved to its current location. Um, you'll notice farm fields and nothing else when the airport came out to the, the current site. Uh, and we saw industry uh, grow out of town and around where we are today. The, the main runway that you see there is the same main runway, same alignment as today. It's gotten longer and it's certainly changed. Uh, and this is Taxiway Echo, uh, which you'll see come up a little bit later in the presentation that we just recently, recently replaced. So looking at the history back in passenger service back to 1963 when we opened where we're at today, we've certainly see a lot of, seen a lot of change and almost linear change until we hit the last 10 years where, where business has been very good. Um, certainly have seen some dips and we knew that the growth we'd seen the last 10 years couldn't continue, but my goodness, never would have expected the impacts of the pandemic that we've actually seen. Um, in fact, the blue line is actual traffic numbers here. The yellow line was a projected forecast. Uh, we do a lot of forecasting work, understanding needs so that we can prepare our infrastructure for those needs. The reality is we're an uh, infrastructure heavy organization. We provide some vital service in police and fire and, and what have you, um, but we have a lot of infrastructure and it's costly and, and takes time to develop. Uh, so the yellow line was a FAA approved forecast in 2016. Red line was a high growth forecast, uh, but 2017 to 2019 was just amazing. Uh, growing very, very quickly. Uh, we were seven years ahead of the base case forecast. Uh, then, of course, the challenges that, that we all know of the pandemic and some of the numbers Tori showed you earlier. We expect, uh, don't have final numbers yet, but expect 2020 to end right around the 2010-2007 uh, million in plane passenger mark. So for the purposes of what we all do, right, construction, design, um, we had to react in 2020. Our initial capital pro program was just under $80 million for 2020. In March, we reacted very quickly and affected a lot of folks in our community, uh, some of you on the call, and we immediately cut about 
$200 million from the capital program. That was work underway, design underway, uh, delay of uh, a number of significant projects. So as we returned to service then, um, we focused first on pr projects underway, like Gateway Phase 2, which you'll see in a moment, but also those projects that were state or federal funded via grants. So what was to be uh, an $80 million program ended the year at a, j just under $33 million. Uh, Most importantly, they're uh, minimizing the local share. The last thing we want to do is, is capital investments to drive up those airline ticket costs because they are related. The biggest uh, capital program we have going right now, we've deemed Project Elevate. Uh, project, think about it, right? That's cool. We're, we're soaring, we're flying, we're elevating. Yeah, I gotta love the marketing piece. Uh, but three components of Project Elevate. Uh, we'll talk about all three. First is a federal inspection station. That is the physical space that Customs and Border Protection needs to screen incoming international passengers and baggage. We are an international airport. CBP has a presence. Uh, they can screen incoming uh, commercial flights, private flights, when you bring your family back from Mexico or Canada, uh, but they cannot screen a full uh, commercial service aircraft full of people and baggage. So that's the goal of the FIS. Also relocation of the air traffic control tower. Uh, show you some insight on that guy in a few minutes. And the expansion and widening of Concourse A. So a year ago at this time, I would have told you Concourse A was the most important thing because we needed the capacity. We needed the gate capacity, the hold room capacity, and, and that changed quickly. Um, what we are moving forward is phase one of the federal inspection station program because uh, we were successful in, in grant funding from both the state and the FAA. Uh, so phase one is happening now. It is an Eastern expansion of the main terminal core. It will contain our fourth baggage handling device, baggage claim, and open next summer. Uh, so uh, we did start construction, of course, uh, cranes around the airport, very, very, uh, analyzed, very strategic, uh, but we are coming well along with the envelope today. So as you pull under the grand canopy, if, if you drop someone off or pick someone up, this is what you're seeing behind the fence to your right, just off the end of the terminal. And again, this will be our fourth baggage claim coming online this summer. Ultimately, the FIS piece is this will be a flex domestic international bag claim device. Um, this is only phase one. Uh, phase two and three will add another baggage claim device dedicated to international and the CBP facilities. Uh, here you see a nice rendering. Uh, the project allows us to extend the curb front as well, that space where you drop off and pick up passengers. We know our capacity constraints at 2019 levels are uh, baggage claim, terminal curb front, and, and gates. So Project Elevate addresses all three of those, but I also mentioned the air traffic control tower. So we have the second oldest air traffic control tower in the, in the top 100 airports. Now, granted, age is not reason to replace something, but what's happening is the line of sight requirement from the air traffic control tower mounted atop the existing terminal is create, creating a number of developmental challenges around the terminal core. So we have identified a new tower site on the east side of the field over by the cargo facilities off Thornapple River Drive. Um, what you see in the bottom right hand corner there, the activities happening now are virtual modeling of that tower location uh, to confirm and have confidence with the air traffic controllers that we're, we're putting in the right spot. From West Michigan's perspective, from the airport's perspective, we just need to get it away from the terminal core so we can continue developing vertically. The third component of Project Elevate I mentioned was the expansion and widening of Concourse A. Um, I, I think many of us will appreciate that 
the concourse was built for 30 to 50 seat aircraft and therefore the hold rooms are built for 30 to 50 people, right? Um, so today's concourse ends just behind the tall glass enclosure you see there. It's 66 foot wide and has seven gates. Once we're done, um, we'll have 15 total gates on concourse A, but more importantly, we'll also be quite a bit wider. This allows us to, to bring the concessions concepts down the center core of the terminal and have quite a bit more space out in those hold rooms. So I mentioned 30 to 50 seat aircraft when the concourse was designed. Today we're pushing regularly 120 and 150 seat aircraft out of the, out of the concourse. So concourse A did go on hold when the pandemic hit because this is a capacity project. Uh, and, and you'll see more on that in a moment. Looking at the terminal as a whole, um, we completed phase one of the gateway transformation project back in 2017. And this did two things. It centralized all of the security offerings and also provided a new marketplace and new concessions, food and beverage post security. Uh, the gateway transformation really encompasses rebranding of the terminal infrastructure. We certainly could have done this in a less grand fashion. But the idea here is that once you're post security, the facility looks and feels like West Michigan, right? The hints of waves of blue in the terrazzo, kind of the, the, the wood ceiling look might be the dunes of the lake shore. So trying to make our airport look and feel like West Michigan. Uh, one of the projects that was halted during COVID was phase two of the gateway transformation, which is now complete actually in the punch list phase. And that look, that feel, that brand of West Michigan is now throughout the terminal. We completed ticketing and baggage claim, which you see here, and now takes you through the, the full journey of the airport. One of the things that we did unique to our industry is raise quite a bit of local interest and uh, capital campaign funds for the airport with the Gateway Transformation Project. So you'll see some branded things throughout the space, a number of partnerships, including one I thought you might find fascinating with the Fry Foundation. So we've, we've put our best foot forward on art trying to capture our community, not just with the building, but also with some of the art and finishes in the space. So we have the scale model that Calder used to model lighting on La Grande Vitesse, which is downtown. So that's now on display. We also have a, a really fascinating stone sculpture that Jason Quigno uh, is finishing now for us. As soon as we can gather in the terminal, this will be erected and, and tell a bit of our Native American story. If you've traveled recently, you've also noticed a few murals that are in place. Uh, one by Nick Nortier, tying flight to nature. This was his take as you head from the marketplace to Concourse B. And one with Reb Roberts. Uh, really, again, taking the infrastructure and giving it some character is the goal of that partnership with the Fry Foundation. I wanted to start first on the terminal and feel free to jump in with questions or comments as we go, but I'd re be remiss if I didn't also acknowledge we have quite a bit of infrastructure out on the airfield. Um, people think of the roadway, the parking garage, ticketing, security, right, terminal, that's what everyone thinks of. But that 3,200 acres that Tori mentioned are, are essential to what we do. Uh, outside of the terminal, there are three runways. Um, and, and what folks don't realize, that main runway is 10,000 feet long and 150 feet wide. Very significant piece of infrastructure that really allows us to connect to the world. Um, so we spend a lot of time, our operations officers are constantly out and about on the airfield making sure it's safe, making sure that it's protected, of course, uh, a pothole on a runway is very different to an aircraft than a pothole on a road, so that doesn't happen. Uh, 
and, and our maintenance folks do a great job keeping the field safe. Um, but on the airport construction front, I wanna show you some, some recent accomplishments. Uh, really three pieces of main infrastructure. First runways where aircraft land and take off. And that's what you saw highlighted here. Uh, connecting to the runways are taxiways. So quite an extensive taxiway system allowing aircraft to move to the runway environment. And the runway is really protected above all else. Uh, so taxiways connect you there, but where aircraft spend a lot of time on the ground are those, those aprons or ramps. So in the center where we've been talking quite a bit is the terminal and terminal ramp. To the east are the cargo facilities. You'll often see FedEx aircraft sitting uh, just off Thornapple River Drive. And then to the north, general aviation, uh, public, private, uh, recreational flyers, business flyers, et cetera. And then our corporate core just west of the main terminal. So diving into the terminal ramp for a moment, the, the ramp was really built out over many decades based on need. Uh, five years back, we, we looked at the apron as a whole and started a project to reconstruct those jigsaw puzzle pieces into one dedicated system. When we work out on the airfield, we very intentionally have to separate aircraft movements from contractor movements. And that's what you're seeing here. That row of orange and white barriers tells the contractor where he needs to stay and tells the aircraft and the ground crews where they need to work. Uh, next quiz question, grab your, grab your text bar there. How thick is the concrete? I'll give you a hint, the full pavement section so concrete, a stabilized base course, drainage layers, sand, full depth is 42 inches. But of that, how thick do you think the concrete surface might be? While you dial that in, I'll give you some insight. Uh, we took actually two years to rebuild the majority of the terminal apron. You see it here, we could only close one connector taxiway and up to two gates at a time. So it took seven phases over two years. And the finished project, product, excuse me, is, is, is fantastic, is fantastic. I'm seeing 24 inches, 10 inches, 16 inches. Uh, ben, you were closest, 18 inches, well done. The concrete service surface is 16 inches thick. Uh, another interesting tidbit, the, the aprons where you see the aircraft park here is really the heaviest load that the pavement see because as soon as they pull away from the gate they start burning fuel so here we're, we're fully loaded right cargo passengers fuel uh, 16 inches so amidst the reconstruction that i just uh, just introduced to you was that tremendous growth and we had good success with our our funding partners and were able to capture some funds to expand the terminal apron while we were finishing the reconstruction. Uh, so because of that growth, we accelerated this project about three years and in 2019 began expansion of the terminal apron. So you see Concourse A here. Um, the Concourse A expansion goes directly south to about this point, 510 feet. Before we can introduce aircraft to that, that concourse, of course, we need the pavement around the concourse for aircraft to function. So that project, apron expansion project, was completed this summer. And you see in uh, the far ground of this photo an asphalt ribbon and some grass uh, where that, ape, that concourse expansion will start as soon as our traffic will permit. Uh, Another view of it there, terminal apron completed. Uh, really three years worth of apron work now, now under our belts. Tori, if you wanna unmute another question here so I can catch my breath for a moment. A terminal traffic question. Last year pre-COVID, I traveled on a short business trip and for the first time ever in a line for security that went all the way out to the street. Was it just a fluke that day or a bunch of 
winter Caribbean flights or something that would happen again from time to time. Do you mind tackling the traffic question? Not at all, and happy to do so. Uh, I, I, I guess from a customer guest experience, I hope that's only one time you experience it, but I will tell you that as Casey mentioned a little bit ago, we were really dealing with expanded growth that was coming at us much faster than what we had anticipated and much faster than what we were ready for. So unfortunately, the lines were out to the baggage area all the way through the TSA, you know, queuing lanes, all the way down the ramps, uh, weaving around in the baggage claim area, and in some cases at the doors. And that was getting to be a pretty frequent um, event for us especially on Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. And so we were having to actively manage that uh, pretty closely. But what Casey was also mentioning was several capital projects that we need to put in place to accommodate the, the amount of growth that we're experiencing. So while we're not seeing that today because we're down about 50% due to the, the COVID restrictions and just people not flying uh, for leisure or business right now, Quite honestly, when things do get back, if we don't have capital infrastructure in place, we could be seeing that again. So what we're doing right now is working very hard to time all of our projects to make sure that they are coming online in time to best serve the, the guest experience and working with the airlines to make sure that that doesn't happen. But honestly, today, it could happen again if we see numbers come back the way they were um, you know, towards the, the tail end of 2019 when things were very strong and the airlines were all pushing about 25 flights out of this facility in the first three hours of the morning. Uh, that was becoming a very recurring uh, issue for us. Good question. Yeah, that's a really good question. And we know that um, when we look at uh, a monthly basis or an annual basis, we have plenty of capacity we really look at two capacity choke points. One is terminal specific, like, like your question, um, and the flow of passengers through the terminal. We also look at airfield capacity. Um, so the challenge that we've had is that morning launch, right? Over the course of a day, there's plenty of gates available, but because of the way airlines do business, the specific morning push creates a, a bottleneck, if you will. Um, and every airline wants to leave Grand Rapids, right, between 6 a.m. and 8 a.m. Uh, and, and that's the, the challenge that you saw there and what Tori's speaking to. There's another question about how cargo flights impacted our business, and that actually speaks to the airside capacity and airside constraints. So I mentioned the three runways, and we are operating about 50% of airfield capacity. So while you're feeling the constraint of, of lines and choke points within the terminal, when we look at operations as a whole, be it cargo operations, occasional military operations, you know, flight training with the West Michigan Aviation Academy, we do have plenty of airfield capacity. So we are not, not to a point where increases in those other activities, general aviation, recreational flying, cargo, et cetera, will impact our cargo, I'm sorry, our passenger operations. So what's next? What's next, Casey? We, we don't just wanna talk about concourse A, we don't wanna just talk about the, the downturn in, in aviation and travel because it will come back. I mentioned earlier that we have a line of sight problem. So an uh, air traffic control tower standing atop the cab with their eye at five foot above the floor is required to see every piece of pavement that they control. So they, of course, when it's not foggy, they need to be able to look out the window of the cab and see the entire airfield, runways and taxiways, which they are responsible for. Uh, so if you have noticed the north portion of our parking garage is three floors instead of four and in areas has no roof. And that is because as an air traffic controller looks to the north, a four story roofed parking garage would block line of sight to the north parallel taxiway. And that is one of the main reasons that we need this air traffic control tower relocated. So we have done some work actually with uh, Fishback and WGI looking at 
what can we do until we get the, really the FAA gets the air traffic control tower relocated. That is a federally owned and operated facility, not something that Tori and I can just pick up and move, right? Quite a process. Uh, so one of our other shortfalls is, is parking. In particular, folks want the close-in covered parking. Uh, so the right solution is a six-story parking garage in the north lot, which is what you're seeing in the foreground here. The reality is one-third of that lot can be developed only to four stories. So trying to work within that existing constraint. So we stepped back, we thought outside of the box a bit, and just beyond us here is the east lot, which also is line of sight constraint, but not quite as bad. So the vision is a consolidated rental car facility in that east lot to take all car rental functions out of the existing garage, freeing up about 1,100 parking spaces there, and developing uh, all of the car rental functions adjacent to the terminal in the east lot. Uh, that helps us in a few ways. It frees up some uh, roadway capacity constraints with less rental cars servicing uh, on the roads. Uh, but really, this, these are the next steps with and just after Project Elevate is to continue parking expansion. So what does the Capital Improvement Program look like in 2021? Uh, certainly, again, reduced. You see a $63 million number there. Uh, a year ago, we were projecting that at well over $100 million. So as soon as our traffic and airline confidence allow, we will resume the Concourse A expansion project. We'll actually be on the street in just a few weeks here for uh, Primary Communications Center, Emergency Operations Center facility. So that will be a, a hard bid you see listed there. And then we get into phase two of the FIS project. Uh, there is some civil work, some road work coming in 2021 and really setting the stage for capacity improvements as we move forward. As we look at the out years then, um, investment in the inline baggage system. So that is how TSA handles and screens your checked baggage that end up down in the belly of the aircraft. You see the CONRAC, that's short for Consolidated Rent-A-Car Facility, and a number of airfield improvements. So what you're seeing happen is, I started the conversation with remodeling the terminal, remodeling the terminal ramp, and we're moving into capacity projects and capacity improvements in the coming five years. That's where we're at. And I hope many of you picked up on a place in there that you or your business can come come help and work out at the airport. Um, let's let's pause there and, and tackle some more questions, Tori. Uh, actually, the first one I'll take is the airport or city setting any specific sustainability targets in future construction. Great question and and I, and I won't defer Tori I'll, I'll go ahead and tackle it uh, first I, I do want to point out that the airport is owned and operated by the Gerald R Ford International Airport Authority in 2016 we separated from Kent County and became an independent airport authority so no local tax dollars come to the airport the investments are grant funds and uh, user fees right from airline uh, airline leases, uh, parking, et cetera. On the sustainability side, um, we have always made a point of putting sustainability at top of mind for our design teams. Uh, we have not made the investment in lead. Uh, we do have some, some challenges for lead prerequisites with the existing terminal, rather focusing efforts on capturing you know best practices and energy and energy recovery units um, we've got some green roof out at the airport just asking our design teams to put sustainability top of mind uh, we have brought on board our first ever environmental manager which has both a compliance role and a sustainability role so you'll start to see more of it uh, but we haven't tooted our own horn much on sustainability, haven't 
established targets, rather uh, capture those opportunities when they're able? That's a really good, really good question. In case you want, yeah. It, yeah, I see you've got one in there for Tom, and, and while you're taking a pause there, um, before you answer that, maybe I could jump back up to Rebecca on her, her question on the cargo flights and just expand on that a little bit more. So obviously we are seeing an impact with the cargo flights. Um, we just came off of what they would consider peak season, so the last quarter of the year is peak season. Obviously that's you know the holiday rush and everybody sending you know packages and buying things online, et cetera. But e-commerce is really picking up. Um, we did end up with about 16% increase for the month of December. That really put us up only about 1% for the year, but keep in mind that that was a year of severely depressed activity in most other places in terms of the businesses that we see. So um, despite only being up 1%, I would say it's a pretty remarkable feat to accomplish that. And I, I would also say we'll continue to see that. We are just wrapping up a cargo study because we do believe there's an opportunity or opportunities for us to play a bigger role in that going forward and, and really being more of that cargo gateway for West Michigan than what we've been in the past. So in the past, we've kind of had a, a more passive take on cargo, uh, but we did just complete a study and are working through uh, the issues with a consultant to help us understand more what those opportunities and, and um, you know, what some of those threats might be as we move forward with it. So it's a great question. We are seeing some more of that activity, what we intend to see more of it. We think e-commerce is gonna be changing a lot of that. We think that we're a good platform to help West Michigan grow in that space. Another question for you, Tori. Uh, what lessons learned from September 11th or other declines, perhaps the recession in 2008, uh, what lessons learned were able to apply to COVID and help us in the, the COVID response? So we looked at that. We looked at several different instances or events that actually impacted aviation over the course of, of many decades. And what is interesting is in all of those cases, it was a much different curve. It was a much different um, challenge for us to take. So we didn't come away from any of those models saying, yep, it's gonna be just like that one, or we think it's gonna flow more like the SARS or you know, swine flu or 9-11. They were all very different events. But what we did notice out of each of those events, and I think we are still seeing it today in that chart that I showed you about the national throughput versus our local throughput illustrates that same story. And that is in each of those pandemics or, or world events, we've always seen West Michigan traffic come back a little bit quicker and a little bit stronger. And so while we can sit here today and say, well, the recovery is gonna take much longer than any other recovery that we've seen uh, from those other events, we do still think it's going to be a stronger recovery for West Michigan. And I've always been, I've been a little bit more bullish on it. I've always said we're closer to two years probably to getting back to some sort of level of normalcy you talk to the airlines and you talk to some of the other larger communities, larger cities, they're saying, you know, it's probably closer to a four or five year uh, recovery path. So those are some of the things we learned, but I think the biggest piece in a general sense is we've gotta be resilient. We know stuff will come back. We've gotta be ready for it. We still have to build and plan for it and design it and construct it. And we need to be, you know, not waiting for it to happen, but anticipating it to happen and helping to facilitate that recovery. And that's the mindset that we've learned from those events. Yeah, that, that's a great point, Tori. Um, the, the recovery that we saw after 9-11 and the recovery that we saw after the 2008 recession were both faster in West Michigan at the Ford Airport than many of our peers. Um, and that's really a, a reflection of what all of you are doing, of our local economy, our local markets, right, that we've, we as a region have diversified into many sectors um, and, and speaks very highly of that. I'd love to say something Tori or I or our peers are doing at the airport is, is has caused the growth, but that's naive, right? Um, it's, it's all of you. It's the West Michigan business. Uh, we are just a, a, an important part of connecting those businesses and being part of the economy. Yeah, in many cases, we're a reflection of the community. You know, like I said, we do try to build and facilitate 
Uh, but at the end result, when you go to measure us, whether it's economic impact or anything else that we focus in on, it's not stuff that we did. It's what our community, what our region has been able to do or benefit from. So again, we're the, we're the platform for others to do business and, and hopefully to do so successfully. Yeah, uh, often referred to as a, air, airports are lagging economic indicators, right? That, that's good stuff. Question from Tom on the FIS rendering. So we'll pull those back up for a minute. Um, ornamental fence appears to be here and anti-ram bollards shown. Um, so both are part components of our security program. Um, the fence all the way around the airport is actually 10 foot chain link with three strands of barb on it. And that does two things. Uh, DNR tells us it's, it's very unlikely for a deer to clear a 10 foot tall fence with three strands of barb. Very happy to report it has been many decades since we've had an airport out on the airfield. Um, like potholes, aircraft don't get along with deer very well. Uh, so that's part of our security program. Then along the terminal curb front, we do have crash bollards. Uh, they're not complicated. Uh, they're not pretty, but there's quite a bit of infrastructure, foundation system, et cetera, below them uh, as part of the terminal curb front. Detracts from the overall view that uh, Tori and our board often push us for, right? What's that forward facing thing when you drive up to the airport, uh, but is important part of our program. So we'll pause there. Uh, we've reached six o'clock and, and I know you're disappointed I didn't talk for four hours. Uh, Love to take on some more questions and dialogue discussion. If you want to type in some questions or go ahead and unmute yourself for some discussion, uh, love to love to facilitate just, that. Just on Tom's question there too, I think he asked when the completion date later this year. I think we're we're talking uh, late summer probably, right? Yep, July. Thanks. So it looks like there's another question in there on air service, um, direct flights, do the airlines recognize that it, that is an opportunity uh, to capture sales, to keep customers from driving to Detroit to get a direct flight? Uh, another good question, yes, the airlines are very key on that, but what an airline will do is look at what's best for the airline. So um, despite what most of us would like, the airline's not necessarily in the market to serve the market for the market. They're in the market to make some money. So they take a very opportunistic look at what they can do to keep market share. What I mean by that is they're not necessarily too concerned if you get on their airplane in Grand Rapids or in Detroit, as long as you get on their airplane. So in this case, a Delta airplane. What they don't want you to do is say, well, I can drive to Chicago and I can get on a United flight and lose you as a customer from Delta to United. So they're very strategic in how they price their flights, where they know that they're going to get their traffic. And in some cases, they're okay letting their traffic take that first leg as a drive market um, to get to their airport where they can you know, pick up that passenger. So it does get a little bit competitive. And I will tell you in West Michigan, whether you're looking at Kalamazoo or Grand Rapids, um, even Flint to, or on uh, Lansing to some extent, they do very much look at how close proximity you are to one of their large hub markets and are willing to place a bet on whether you're gonna drive and get on their airplane or go somewhere else and get on another airline's airplane. That's what's gonna concern them. But we do work with them all the time. We try to make sure that we've got consistent pricing uh, to help keep people on their airplanes here and the airlines at this point, especially given the pandemic and how that's really turned the world upside down in terms of how to serve and get their passengers and understand what's happening with their passengers. Um, We're working much more closer to them, just trying to relay what is happening in our market. What is our market need? Because they have not been able to figure this out and really invest the time and energy to understand each and every single market that they serve. So communication through this pandemic has been much more critical for the airlines in terms of understanding how to serve their markets and how to best do uh, business for themselves. What other questions or comments can we help you with? What can we do to, to help you? 
I know you showed the um, <clears throat> the graph of uh, the different airlines that are uh, being served at the airport. Is there any um, plans for ex expanding that? And, uh, I know you touched on uh, it's kind of a um, yeah, it started to touch on it, but is there any uh, desire to uh, grow that into um, more airlines coming in? Yeah, there's there's always a desire. It's always a balance, right? We don't want to have you know new service start and degrade existing service, uh, take away a hub or something that somebody is relying on right now with the business. So we are always having those conversations. The airlines that come to mind are JetBlue, you know, Spirit, Alaska, having conversations with them. But we really have to make sure that we can get people back on airplanes. And that we're demonstrating that to the airlines that we're a viable market to them and that we're a competitive market for them. So, you know, as we said before, we are a reflection of the community. When we are talking to the airlines, that's what they want to know. How are the businesses doing? How are they growing? What other communities do you need to connect with so we can figure out whether the airline can make money serving that market? But we're having those conversations with them all the time under our air service development efforts. Again, keeping them apprised of what's happening, how our region is growing and how competitive and efficient we can be as an, an airport operator to make their experience here and for their guests to, as best as, as it can be. Uh, but continually having those dialogue and trying to figure out when is the right time that an airline will finally get over the, the hurdle and say, yes, we wanna, we wanna start new service here. My wife would really appreciate Alaska Airlines. So if that has anything. <laughs> we'll add that to the list. <laughs> Thanks. Any others? Right. I would ask one if I haven't hogged the mic too much already. Um, being in kind of the the construction side of things, obviously you know your audience here, and and some of the engineers and architects might already know this answer. But what do you, um, what qualifications would bidding contractors need to meet, or are you looking for any um, specific requirements that you have in place to do business, or provide construction business for the Ford Airport? Yeah, I'll let Casey. He runs all those selection, you know, criteria process, but Casey, are you willing to take that on and share with the group? Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's start, um, let's start on the construction side. We are, I mentioned that we separated from Kent County and are an independent airport authority. We're still a public entity, right? We are a public entity similar to a municipality and uh, we are governed by a publicly appointed board and and all of the public procurement process rules apply. Now, each of our funding sources have a few different rules. Um, I mentioned the operations center earlier, that will be an airport or locally funded project, which means we'll put that out for open public bid, and that'll be a hard bid job. Uh, we have been exploring different delivery methods over the past five years, um, design, bid, build is the most common and kind of comfortable for our industry. Um, we have reached into construction manager at risk and design, build. Uh, both CMAR and design, build, we've procured based on qualifications and then pricing. So qualifications to short list, list and included pricing as a final selection component for CMAR in design build. And the reason we've done that actually flops over to the architecture and engineering side. Um, our most of and our largest engineering and architecture projects have F FAA funds in them. And the FAA does require qualifications only based selection. So uh, those architecture engineering services are selected based on qualifications, most commonly a two part submittal it's part one written qualifications shortlisted to part two uh, interviews and then following identification of the most qualified respondent we negotiate terms for a contract um, we do find great success in the construction manager at risk role because we treat projects and contracts as partnerships we've seen good value and bringing contractors in as early as possible and having the contractor at the table during design with the architects with the engineers so we're all 
hearing the same story and all talking the same language, right? Um, there, there are a few additional rules that apply uh, specific to construction for federally funded projects, right? Davis-Bacon wage rates, uh, by American requirements, um, DBE participation, et cetera. Um, kind of run the gambit. I've, I've kind of touched on every bit of, of procurement, right? Except for, eh, we just go out and pick somebody. That, that certainly doesn't happen at the airport. Uh, you will see in the next 12 to 24 months a more intentional effort on local and smaller businesses. Uh, so we're working through a more defined program now. I mentioned our federal programs have a DBE requirement, which is managed by MDOT. So that puts us in a tough spot where when we're out doing heavy civil work out on the airfield, MDOT is really good at DBE, right? Established program, established contractors. Well, you get into a building in vertical construction, which we do quite regularly, there aren't many DBEs in MDOT's MUCP program. So that is a very significant challenge for us. We want to help foster and mentor those smaller companies. Um, so we also do small contract, small construction or material purchase procurements, and that's direct from the airport purchasing department. Um, and, and that's where we'll, You'll, you'll see some some targeted changes for again really local small business development and it's twofold right the small projects where we can directly buy from and help those smaller companies we're going to do that on the larger projects we're looking for the larger contractors to step up and provide that guidance and mentorship of the smaller companies we all jump to construction when i give that dissertation but that also applies to uh, design and uh, engineering architecture services. Wow, that was way more than you bargained for on that one, wasn't it? Well, you told me there's a chance. <laughs> there's, there's a way in there somewhere. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, I, I'd be foolish not to, to point out um, if, if you're in a business where, you know, you provide materials or supplies or would be interested in those smaller contracts, purchasing at grr.org, then we'll get you on our, our procurement distribution list, purchasing at grr.org. Um, in addition to just being on the list, um, the purchasing team will connect with you directly and help target opportunities as well. Uh, this is Mark Lukowski. Uh Sorry, um, I uh, did come on uh, late. I was tied up in a meeting, and I'm sorry uh, if I ask a question now that uh, you've already addressed. But uh, I uh, did hear Tori uh, talk uh, quite a bit about uh, passenger airlines. Uh, what about the commercial and uh, FedEx, UPS, uh, other uh, Amazon? I'm understand they purchase some planes uh, and uh, the airport uh, the airport's involvement with them any expansion that type of thing yeah great uh, mark we did talk a little bit about it and we are just finishing up a cargo study because we recognize that for the most part we've taken a pretty passive role on on the cargo side of the house in terms of the commercial cargo operations here so the you know the integrators the ups and the fedex and and so forth that you mentioned um, but also looking at the opportunities like you know the prime air amazon um, you know business that's out there right now and really the intent for the study was inventory what we have try to obtain information about what the region needs and where it's shipping and, and what it's shipping and then figure out what is the strategy for us to be a bigger player in cargo space going forward. And that's what we're focused on. We just are wrapping up, in fact, we haven't even shared it with our board yet, just wrapping up that study, but certainly hope that in 2021 that we're playing a more active role in the cargo scene. Uh, again, it's something we've recognized we haven't been as assertive as we could have been with it. And we're, we're you know, trying to dust that off and, and spruce up our efforts there. Very good, thank you. Yep, thank you.
All right, does anybody else have any questions for Tori or Casey? One last shot as you're thinking, uh, just I wanna say thanks to Casey for the heavy lift on, the, on tonight's presentation. So thank you, Casey. I also wanna say thank you to Justin for connecting us and uh, Graham for you for, for hosting us and thank all of you for participating tonight. And at any time, reach out to us. We're here to help and serve. So let us know how we can best do that for you. Yeah, great, thank you. Yeah, Tori and Casey, that was a, a fantastic uh, presentation. Uh, flowed well and uh, very informative. So uh, we do appreciate your time and um, your efforts in putting together this presentation for us. Um, I can see from the comments, uh, you know, <laughs> a lot of other people uh, have the same sentiment. So thank you. Great, thank you. Y'all enjoy the rest of your evening too. All right, thanks everyone. All right. Sounds great, really appreciate it. Take, Take care. care. Thank you, bye. Thank you, bye. Hey Ed, are you still there? I am. Hey, how's it going? Good. Good. Hey, are you still going to be sending out info for the uh, uh, CDT training class? Uh, yes, I am. I, I spent a lot of my time today on that. I've been in Colorado Springs since uh, January 2. Lucky you. So anyway, I was Casey talked about being of passing his CDT and I started looking through my old emails and he was coming up as 2005. Oh, wow. <laughs> I still had his name buried in my, my emails here. So yes, um, I'm hoping to uh, get information out again to everybody. Cool. Did, did you just sign up as a member? Yeah, I was a, a member last year with the Lansing group. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I decided to join Grand Rapids this year. But uh, I started studying um, in like November of last year. And uh, I'm looking forward to the class because it's a very dense book to just try to read through 